Hi, my name's Andrew, and today we'll be doing coding matters focusing on burns and particular surgical management and medical support of the patients that have suffered burns injuries. I'm delighted to be joined by Megan Baker, who's a clinical nurse who works in the burns area. Thanks for joining us, Megan. You're welcome. So there'll be some principles that are common to a lot of the other coding videos that we've done, but there's a lot of specific things to burns because it's a very important and niche area to look after some very sick patients. So what we'll be covering is how do we document the burns and initial management, the use of abbreviations and making sure those abbreviations are appropriately understood. We'll be documenting complications and you'll see some very common themes in the way that they can influence the complexity of the DRGs that are coded. Uh, in particular, burns patients can really benefit from a lot of allied health involvement because the complications are not just medical and surgical in nature. They have a broad range of complications that are commonly occurring even with the best management. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the microbiology that occurs in burns patients, both in terms of colonisation and infections and the antibiotic role in terms of prevention versus therapeutic effect. Some of the key points that we would love for you to come away from today's talk is being very specific in our terminology and in our documentation and not assuming that things will be picked up uh, but being very specific about our assessments, documenting the quite broad range of complications that occur in these patients and lastly to be clear about the microbiology and antibiotics as that's an area that's commonly missed or documented poorly and therefore the coding is missed out. Just a reminder that with all coding we need to be able to uh, provide the symptoms or signs, link that with a diagnostic or assessment statement that clearly shows what the condition is and perhaps the underlying cause or triggering effects. Uh, we then have to document the kind of care plan and appropriate investigations and interventions that are done and that's particularly relevant in the burns area. So uh, Megan, tell us a bit about someone presents with burns. What are the really important things we need to be documenting up front? So the most important things initially are mechanism of injury of burn, location of burn, and depth of burn. So when we look at uh, depth of burn, there's five burn depths that we define. Um, so you've got burns that will be healing spontaneously and burns that will require surgical intervention for into broader categories. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at location of the body. Uh, if it's a certain size, so we talk about total body surface area. Sure. So anything above 20% is considered a large burn and anything above 15 to 20% is where we look at fluid recess and we look at a bigger um, pathophys response from the burn injury. So the patient's more, like, more likely to be unwell and need further the interventions and, and treatment. Okay, that makes sense to me. And, and what are the different uh, depths of burns and how does that compare to some of the other terminology where we're talking about the thickness versus the depth versus first or third degree burns? What's the, what's the deal and what should we be documenting? So we don't use first, second and third, that's an American terminology. When we define burns for TBSA or total body surface area, we're looking at erythema is like a sunburn but that's not calculated in our TBSA. So our burn depths we discuss are superficial, partial thickness, mid dermal, deep dermal, and then full thickness. Deep dermal and full thickness are your surgical intervention ones and mid, superficial and partial are in your spontaneous healing ones. Okay, I follow, um, even just as a physician trainee. <laughs> thanks for walking us through that. And, and we've seen through, um, going through a number of examples, some of which we'll show you in this video, that the depth of the burn and whether it's requiring surgical intervention makes a huge difference to the clinical outcomes of the patients and naturally uh, that flows on to the activity-based funding and there's massive differences in the funding of a reasonably simple burn that does not require um, surgical intervention with yep. minimal complications versus someone that is returning to theatre again and again yep. with multiple debridements, skin grafts, use of BTM and other things. Yep. And actually those people, even with the best care and prevention, will still suffer a range of complications yep. um, that can result in a lot of consumption of resources. So documenting that stuff is really important so that we can recoup those funds for the hospital. Yeah, definitely. So um, documenting all the sites of the burn, I've seen some examples of this where they're documenting specific locations and the, the, the depth of the burn can be different in different parts of the body. It can. Most burn, significant burn injuries or even a smaller burn will be mixed depths. So you will have an area where the, like, the mechanism might be a hot oil scald. So where that oil has splashed initially is where it's deeper mm -hmm. and then the surrounding areas um, might not be as deep. And somewhere you've done an effective cooling, so 20 minutes of running water. If you've done good first aid, uh, that burn might not progress to a deeper burn injury um, where you may have missed out on first aid or where it's been a quite 
a hot mechanism uh, that you will, that burn will progress and even despite best efforts it might turn from a partial thickness wound into a full thickness wound after a day or several hours later. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, debridement versus excision makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also aware that uh, the progress in terms of skin grafting and alternatives to skin has really advanced in the yeah. last two decades. Yeah. So we're now using BioBrain and also BTM. Uh, what's the difference between those two and why is it important that we document okay. it? So they're both skin substitutes and we can define skin substitutes as epidermal or dermal. Um, BioBrain is a temporary skin substitute that uh, replicates the epidermis layer of the skin. Okay. Uh, it comes off after 14 days and it's used to aid or to speed up uh, spontaneous wound healing. BTM is a dermal skin substitute, so the second layer of the skin. Uh, it stays in the body, uh, it doesn't get removed, uh, and after four to six weeks of integration you have a neodermis and then that's when you do a skin graft on top. Okay, yeah, makes sense. A lot of changes there. Uh, so just presenting someone with a burn is not enough. We need to be really writing how did they get that burn and what yes. was the mechanism. So, um, even when I was in medical school, describing whether it's a thermal burn, whether it's from direct fire versus heat, whether it's a chemical burn yeah. uh, and other burns as well. And not just that that's the, the term, but the circumstances, like describing what was the incident that resulted in that uh, contact of the patient's skin, which we never kind of mode, is that right? Yeah, so we're looking at the whole event. So especially if it was in a confined area, you might be at risk of an airway injury. So if, the, if for example, you've got a, a 27 year old girl who's working on her car uh, and she's under the bonnet and then suddenly the carburetor explodes on her and she mm. sustains uh, flash flame burns, but then her shirt catches on fire um, and she has uh, unfortunately then burnt her chest and legs as well. Mm. Um, then you're gonna end up with potential airway injury, plus you've got flash, burn, flash burns to the face, but you're potentially going to have deeper burns to her body yeah. as a result of the um, shirt catching on fire. Yeah, so I suppose making sure that our documentation is rich in detail yeah. to reflect the detail of those events, yeah. um, because that can really help predict what's going to happen. The trajectory of, yeah, the seriousness of the burn. So in this circumstance, as with some areas like stroke and ICU, there's actually another organisation that collects data, um, and so that our documentation and coding is important, not just for activity-based funding and, and clinical outcomes, but it's also important for the Burns Registry, is that right? Yeah, so we've got the um, brands, it's, it stands for the uh, Burns Registry of Australia and New Zealand, so that's collected at all the Burns locations around Australia and in New Zealand it's a main body uh, registry it's run through the Monash Uni or in conjunction with Monash Uni mm -hmm. uh, and it's a basis for lots of research in education and prevention of burns as well so it's been going for over 10 years now from memory uh, right. and it's quite a detailed um, database so the documentation is really two birds with one stone it's for our coding yeah. for the hospital and it's also and for the broader brands. organization and, yeah. and advancing our understanding of birds management. yeah and we're seeing now because we've got such a significant amount of data that there's actually a lot of research and lots of reporting has come of it, which has been really beneficial. Okay, that's good. So we've included here a list of the commonly used abbreviations that get used in burns management. A lot of them are quite unfamiliar to me uh, as more of a physician uh, practitioner. Um, some of these are really important to understand if you're using, you'd be using these really commonly in the burns unit, yeah. but outside the burns unit, very rarely. So yeah. I think um, ideally when we're using electronic medical record systems, we can actually just set these up so that when everyone's typing it, it automatically expands so that if anyone who's not familiar with this area can actually read it very, very yeah. plainly. And we're trying to move away from abbreviations to write the full words, so not just FT, but full thickness. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good to me. So as with every other condition that we've covered in this series, um, there is so much complexity that can be added. Well, you'll see later there is a number of disease related groups um, that will cover burns depending on the nature of the burn, the body surface area where there's an inhalation injury and what kind of surgical procedures have been used to manage it. Uh, but the principles remain the same. If there is um, complexity here, if there are complications, associated trauma uh, and other associated conditions that are complicating the admission, we need to write them really plainly uh, with a little bit of detail about how they're managed so that they can fit into the big picture of coding. So you can see here a lot of conditions that we've seen in other areas as well, whether they develop um, dehydration, acute kidney injury, uh, there's obviously malnutrition, intestinal malabsorption is very common because of the edema, uh, muscle wasting because of the immobility and deconditioning associated. Um, often these people are very well resuscitated from a fluid perspective, but we're not always 100% correct. Sometimes we can be underfilling them, that's hypovolemia, or we can be overfilling them with fluid overload. Um, naturally, very high risk of thrombosis, so whether it be a DBT or primary embolism. 
um, and other infections as well, whether it be you know, aspiration or hospital acquired pneumonia or urinary tract infection from their catheter that we need to use. All these things can be documented very clearly and will contribute to the complexity. You can also see, as we've talked about, with the way that people present is not just with a burn, often it's in the, the course of another traumatic situation that may require other management um, and can have therefore other associated complications. We've got wound infections there, compartment syndrome, uh, traumatic shock, acute blood loss um, from, uh, causing anemia, and inhalation injury, which is obviously very specific to burns in particular. And then people will, who are stuck in hospital for a long time, particularly those that are suffering, that these people are in pain a lot. Yeah. They are very limited mobility. They're isolated from their families, particularly with the COVID times with the limited visitors. Naturally, it's going to impact their well-being and their mental health. Mm -hmm. And so documenting that appropriately, whether it be that they have a delirium acutely, whether the initial injury was related to alcohol use, it's pretty common to have uh, be intoxicated and have an accident resulting in a burn. And they may actually have withdrawal symptoms or dependence problems once they're actually admitted that we need to be managing. Uh, likewise, perhaps being in hospital, uh, adjusting to that brings out an adjustment disorder or exacerbates what is usually an underlying reasonably mild anxiety disorder suddenly becomes much more significant. And you see a lot of that yeah, on the ward. Yeah, we see a lot of that on the ward, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. And especially our patients, are, it's a trauma, so they've gone through something very traumatic. And, Absolutely. And being stuck in bed, being able to dwell over the whole thing over and over uh, for days, potentially. Mm. Um, and even despite our best efforts that, yeah, there's a lot of penetral complications that come from a hospital admission. Yeah. I think it's easy to get caught up on the, uh, the thing that you're seeing in front of you, the burns, the surgery, the core yeah. products that we're using, the antibiotics. But ultimately, if we're coding these things, we can improve our funding and have better access to psychological supports yeah, um, and definitely. dedicated mental health, which is it's all part of that holistic recovery. Yeah, and there's a lot of research out there that unfortunately, of the patient population for burns, there's a significant number of mental health patients that are enter our facility for treatment. Mm -hmm. So um, once you've gone through that acute stage of the management, they're still in a recovery. There can be other elements that sometimes miss out in terms of documentation. So skin grafts can work well, but sometimes they don't. And sometimes they can fail. Sometimes they can be rejected. Uh, getting infected is, is a, a much feared complication as well. It can yeah. have an infection that leads to failure. Uh, and naturally antibiotic resistance is a lot more common in these patients than in the rest of the population. So mm -hmm. documenting those very clearly is really important. So we've got some examples um, here, which is a complexity table. You can see the numbers on the right-hand side are just representing how uh, the factor of complication uh, and complexity that these things add, in particular being ventilated for greater than or equal to 96 hours, is associated with the highest level of complexity uh, for severe full thickness burns. And you can see skin grafts um, uh, as well are associated with different levels of complexity. So let's explore that a little bit more now. Here's an example of a 55 year old male with full thickness burn to the calf, less than 10% total body surface area. I think we're comfortable with that acronym. Yeah. Uh, and we've written the, the mechanism of the injury um, is the exhaust pipe um, of a motorbike in the garage at home. So that's very clear, it's a thermal injury. If this person was marked as a severe burn, which this one would be, but didn't require surgical intervention, we're looking at about a $5,000 remuneration. If that is associated with a full or split thickness graft, and it was reasonably uncomplicated with only a couple of complications, that's $8,000. So you can see that's doubled the funding immediately. However, if this person maybe had five or more elements of complexity, they were dehydrated, they got a DVT, they had a urinary tract infection, they had adjustment disorder, you can see those things are simple and could all occur within one week. That's suddenly increasing the complexity up to major at around $52,000. Obviously these numbers change year to year, um, but you see the principle at play there is, is a huge amount of remuneration difference if we're documenting our complexity appropriately. Some of the allied health issues, um, we've covered a little bit of this, but we wanted to highlight um, it's not just about what the doctors and nurses are doing. No. Uh, our allied health is such key members of our treatment teams uh, as a multidisciplinary approach. Um, so in terms of dietitians, malnutrition, which can uh, be marasmus or quashicor, and documenting the severity is really important. So thank you dietitians for your quality uh, documentation. Refeeding syndrome is not uncommon. It doesn't code well. Um, so writing intestinal malabsorption or other related symptoms is the way to get that one uh, being recognized. Gastric stasis, quite common. 
deconditioning um, or in more severe con conditions, sarcopenia or specific muscle wasting, if you can document where that muscle wasting is, often proximal. And then like we've talked about, the mental health impacts. Um, and some of them will actually have pain or deformity requiring um, orthotics and some splints or other tools through occupational therapy. Yeah. So all of them, the physiotherapists are such key uh, parts of our team and they get their funding because we write it in the correct way and then we can uh, get the remuneration. Uh, microbiology is really interesting in burns. I've always had an interest in this area. Um, so there's a big difference as it is in haematology. There is a lot of colonization of bacteria that becomes evident because we're looking when yeah. we have burns. Um, that may not be actually clinically significant because it may not be an actual infection. So differentiating between bacterial colonization versus bacterial infection or the opportunistic fungal infections that I know that can also happen once we've actually marinated them in antibiotics. Yeah. Um, also the hospital acquired infections like we've talked about, hospital acquired pneumonia, urinary tract infections from urinary catheters, all of those things. Um, documenting them in the right way means that we can categorise them appropriately. Um, an easy win is antibiotic resistance. As soon as you've got anything that's resistant in any antibiotic, just writing that clearly will help represent their complexity accurately. Mm -hmm. And then being very clear about what antibiotics are we giving in a protective or prophylactic fashion versus those that we are giving to treat an active infection is really important. Um, it, this is quite a complex area. It really is, yeah. Burns and infections, are huh, they come hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, we do quite a good job through surgical debridement in the theatre setting to limit or to try and minimise the impact of the potential infection. Mm -hmm. But you can't, unfortunately, when it has, especially the larger burns, you can't avoid some form of infection, which yep. is why we use a, a heavy amount of antibiotics for our burns patients. And yep. we do see antibiotic resistance, unfortunately, as well. So here's another example of some of that complexity at play. I've got a 42 year old female with a full thickness burn to the, uh, the chest and upper airway with an inhalation injury. Still not a, a massive total body surface area and we've documented that it's due to ignition of a barbecue gas bottle whilst cooking at a camping ground. Fortunately uh, not too rare an incident to occur. Uh, so the principal procedure in this example is a split thickness graft and you can see the differences there between minor complexity and then having a few complications and going up to $22,000 for intermediate or if you've got five or more complications going up into the kind of 52,000 range. Those are huge they're differences. Huge, yeah. I, I've been honestly very surprised at how much there's yeah, a difference me, there. Yeah, this is blowing me away a bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, if they um, were to be, have the major complexity and be ventilated for more than 30, 96 hours, that goes up by almost four times to almost $200,000. Yeah. And that's just representing that these patients, and I've seen some when I've been in ICU, can be in ICU for weeks on end yeah. and are going to theatre every third day. It's costing a lot of money to, to the hospital. These people need that level of support to have the best chance of recovery and return to independent living. And we're lucky to live in Australia who will pay that money. Yes. And if we document it, our hospitals won't run out of money. So please do that. So I'm going to give you an example of what a mixed depth burn, uh, what the outcome could be and how it does change uh, sometimes in our patient population. So if we had a 55 year old male who had that mixed depth burn to his calf instead of a full thickness burn, went to theatre and initially had a scrub debridement and application of Biobrain, that burn depth progressed to a deeper burn that required grafting, then you would go back to theatre and do a split thickness skin graft. So the complexity of the wound has then changed the complexity of the patient's admission. So in summary, today we've covered how do we document burns appropriately and some of the really key pieces of information that we need to document. We talked about the use of abbreviations, which we're trying to move away from and perhaps using your electronic medical record to automatically fill in those abbreviations. Uh, we talked about the major role that complications play in our burns patients, a very wide range of complications that do cause very significant suffering and documenting those will help bring appropriate funding and the appropriate statistics that we need to improve care in the long term. Allied Health play a very important role in our burns uh, patient recovery and documentation from them and from the medical and nursing teams is really key. And finally, we talked about microbiology, differentiating between colonisation, active infection, hospital acquired infections, and which antibiotics are prophylactic versus therapeutic. Thanks for joining us, Megan. You're very welcome. Thanks and for having me. Hopefully this will uh, help our burns and associated teams document that little bit extra. Yeah, I'm hoping so too. Cool. Thank you.